That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Getting accurate information from scripture is so important because if not, you can mislead people. It can actually lead people to a crisis of faith. Misleading people can cause people to not have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're going to quote the scripture, make sure you get it right. God is good, and somebody would say what? All the time, all the time, God is good. We do honor the Lord because he's first in our life, and he is our life, and I want to honor my precious wife of almost, well, now, as of last month, 33 years. Um, she recently had surgery and I've had the privilege of being home and just cooking and cleaning and washing clothes and folding stuff. I was like, Lord, this, I was, I'm glad, I'm glad to be able to do it for her. And I'm learning how to cook stuff. I made uh, walnut crusted salmon the other year. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I'm learning how to do this thing, but honor to her. I'm sure she's watching and and I just also want to thank God for three of our children being here. David on the keyboard, Mr. D.O. 3 himself. Uh, I was someplace the other night and somebody from Nashville say, are you David Outing's dad? So now I'm known as David Outing's dad because he's the popular one. And my son Nathan and my baby boy Daniel is here sitting on the front. I appreciate them. And I want to say this, Pastor D, um, this morning, just as I was sitting there, just in quietness, and things were coming to me. I just want to tell you, man, I love you. And I appreciate you for the leader that you are. When the story of David Jacques is told, I pray that he and TKC would be a case study for other pastors, leaders, and churches because we have a great leader in the person of our lead pastor. Would you clap your hands for him? Lady Karen, God bless you. If you're watching, we love you, the children, and we bless the Lord for who he is. Romans 4.17, and I'm going to continue the series that Pastor D started. Uh, I believe this is like the eighth chapter of it. That's not what he said. And things that we say that Jesus didn't say. But the title, my subtitle, the title of my message there is, I can't call it. You know how we ask somebody, hey, what's up, how you doing? I can't call it, right? But you're going to see where I'm going in a minute. Are we changing? Hold it right here. Oh, bless the Lord. Okay. You know, man, I'm 54, bro. Come on now. Y'all got to tell me these things. All right. Romans 4.17. I want to read this because this is a verse that is quite often read and quoted and preached and taught out of context. And I want to read it. And it says, and I want to read it in the King James Version because people don't like to quote it from the other versions. They love to quote it from uh, Romans 4, 17. And it says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickened the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. 
call those things that be not as though they were meaning call that house into existence. Call that car into existence. Call your health, that new job, that new career into existence. Here's my response. That's not what God meant. And therefore, that is not what he said. Well, what about Proverbs 18, 21? Death and life is in the power of the tongue. I'm glad you asked. Because what happens with biblical interpretation, we take verses of scripture, lift them up off the page, and misquote them out of its context. Because if you really want to understand Proverbs 18, 21, you got to really go back to the 17th verse. Uh, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life is in the power of the tongue was a relational term. Death and life was meant to be a relational term that governs how you treat and talk to people. You can offend people, death, or you can build them up, life. It wasn't meant for you to apply it, and st apply it by standing over a dead loved one's casket and quote the verse or someone's sickbed and quote that verse. It was all about how you treat the people in your life because the previous verses talk about a brother offended. We must understand and speak scripture the way God meant for it to be spoken. A few weeks ago, Pastor D in his message, the gospel of contentment, he said growth is inhibited by people not speaking the same thing and that God wants us to find contentment in him. In other words, we must speak and quote scripture the same as God meant for it to be communicated so that we can be in agreement with God and his word. The scriptures, this is something that when I was going through the Bible portion of uh, my undergrad, at Palm Beach Atlantic, I remember my Bible teacher saying this. He says, the scriptures cannot mean to us what it didn't mean to the original author and audience being addressed. It can't mean something different today that it didn't mean in its original context. So now, let us read Romans 4 and 17 in its context by starting at the 16th verse. And I want to read this one in the, in the NLT. And it reads, So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Calleth those things that be not as though they were. Let's read 17 again. What, what, what 17 means is, is that God told him, I have made you, Abraham, the father of many nations. And this happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. I'm going to explain what dead back to life means. Even there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. 19, and Abraham's faith did not weaken even though at about 100 years of age, everybody say 100, he figured out his body was as good as dead. <laughs> Back then they didn't have Viagra. And then he said, my, my wife's womb was dead. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. At 100 years old, you told me I'm going to have a big old family. It's going to fill the earth, but we don't even have one child. 
and I'm old and Sarah's womb is dead, but he never wavered. His faith grew stronger and in this he brought glory to God. Last verse, 21 says he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. In other words, I can't call it. Only God can cause those things that be not as though they were. But preachers will tell you, you got the power to do it. And then they'll quote that verse and they're quoting it out of context because Paul was saying God is the only one that can call those things that be not as though they were. It is important and necessary for us to understand and quote scripture accurately. Otherwise, we will have a crisis of faith. And watch this. Here is what a crisis of faith is. It's when one's faith becomes dangerously unstable, when God is perceived to have failed them or feels that he doesn't care about them. And we'll go into a crisis of faith. A crisis of faith is when the God we sung about, God is so good, God is so good. God is so, look at the soul, <laughs> good, he's so good to me, until you get that doctor's report, un un until you get furloughed, un un until you get that broken heart. We'll sing the song. And the crisis of faith is when we sing that God is good, but it doesn't seem so good because it don't seem like God was true in his response to my misinterpretation of Scripture. How about John the Baptist? John the Baptist is, he is the MC of all MCs. John the Baptist is the one who introduced Jesus to the world. It was John the Baptist that said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It is John the Baptist who baptizes the Messiah. And he says, not only it says, but he heard a voice from heaven, the Father confirming it, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Then we come to Luke 7, 12 through 20. I'm not going to read it. But while in prison, John's disciples, his friends, did some prison ministry and came to visit John. But he expected his cousin Jesus to come. However, Luke 7 tells us that it was a funeral taking place and Jesus resurrected the son of a grieving woman. And when people saw that, John's friend said, wow, Jesus resurrected somebody from the dead right out of their casket. And they ran and told John about it. John's friends brought the news to John while in prison. But instead of being excited about Jesus helping others, John felt betrayed by the very one he introduced to the world. In other words, John would say, don't tell me God is good when God won't even visit me in my time of pain. Jesus never came and visited him. He let him stay in prison. In fact, not only did Jesus not come, he let John the Baptist beheaded, get beheaded, lose his life. And you know what John told his friends? I want you to go find that Messiah cousin of mine and ask him, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? And I can imagine one of the friends said, well, John, I, you're the one who introduced him to us and told us he was the one. And then you said you heard the father confirm it and now you're asking us to go back and ask the question. John the Baptist was in a crisis of faith because when you think God has failed you, when you think God doesn't care about you, you can actually question the very existence of God. I don't want to hear about other folks' testimony. 
I can imagine John saying, until he changes my situation, don't talk to me about the goodness of God. This is what a crisis of faith looks like. Many, watch this. Here's another point I want you to pay attention to. Many in today's church have attributed goodness to God only if they feel he's been good to them. Oh God, help me here. Why you don't go to church anymore? Because God let my mama die. Can't be no God. Why you don't go to church anymore? Because I went through a terrible divorce and he let me marry the wrong person. Well, well, why you don't go to church no more? My car wouldn't start and it made me late for work and then I got fired. Let me tell you how much deliverance you will get when you have a new battery in there. Y'all catch that later. You got signs about the battery two weeks ago when it started. And now when it finally just don't start, I, Lord, I in the glory to his name. Then you bring the praise and worship out, lay hands on the car. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I, I pray, God, that you let this car start. God, I need you, Jesus. Help me, Lord. I, Lord, I need you, God. Let this car start. Let me tell you something. You get a whole lot of salvation when you just go buy a new battery. <laughs> but we get into a crisis of faith why you don't go to church anymore he let me lose my house he let me lose my car my job he let me get cancer he let my mama die of cancer that's our story and our family we watch mom give God praise until she couldn't breathe no more. Mama showed us how to live and she showed us how to die. Wow. But some people were getting into this crisis of faith. You know, I just don't go to church. I don't believe in God because I, I don't believe that God is so powerful to change situations, but he wouldn't change mine. Dr. Darius Daniels, one of the favorite in this place and one of the mentors of our own, Pastor D, in his master class on theology that I would encourage any one of you to take, Dr. Darius Daniels masterfully stated this. He said, the word of God is not the word of God unless it's properly interpreted. In other words, and, and, and then he's appendage to that, he say, God is only responsible for what he actually said, not what we think he said. Oh, that's a good one right there. Let me read this little story. James Packer wrote this in his book, Your Father Loves You. He said, we cannot arrive at a true understanding of God's word by detaching texts from their context to find personal meaning in them and be feeding them into the world of our private preoccupations and letting that world impose new senses on old biblical phrases. A theological student who, I'm, who I later knew as a senior friend committed himself to starting a ministry in the north of England when he received a very attractive invitation to join a teaching institution in South Wales instead. He did not feel able to withdraw from his commitments, but one day he read Isaiah 43 and 6. And it says, part of it says, I will say to the North, give up. So he thought, he thought God was telling him to go North and concluded that it was God telling him that he would be providentially released from his promise, so set free to accept the second invitation. But no such thing happened. However, he still went north after our wondering what went wrong. But then he read the other part of Isaiah 43 and 6 and noticed and continued and said, and to the south do not withhold. He stopped with the north. And we'll use scripture like that. At this point, it dawned on him that he had been finding meaning in the text that was never really there. Instead, the concerns which he brought to his reading of the text had governed his interpretation of it. 
finally said, to impose meaning on the text is not the way to learn God's law. Yet we constantly do this, don't we? And it is one chronic obstacle to understanding. So what then is the context of Romans 4, 17? That faith in God, number one, is made available to everyone. When you read that whole, that whole chapter and that whole part, what, 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 Ab what, what Paul is saying is that because Abraham became a father of many nations, he made a faith, the faith of God available to everyone. Also, about Abraham becoming a father of many nations, Abraham believed God promises even though he had no children. Romans 4, 17 Basically saying, though I am old and my body is dead. Hebrews 11 and 12 says, a whole nation came from one who was good as dead. Meaning, his, he was so old, his body couldn't even perform as a man and should with his wife. Because the Bible says he was 100 years old and Sarah is 90 at the time. And she was way, way past childbearing. Genesis 18, 11, and 12 tells us that. And, and, and Sarah said, Sarah even said, I'm an old, worn out woman. I'm worn out. Ain't nothing, good, ain't nothing happening over here. And then she said, when I am old, shall I have pleasure? meaning there was no Viagra for Abraham and menopause was behind Sarah. But somebody say, but God. Somehow, at 90 years old, Sarah had one egg left. Mm. Being preserved by God in her womb until the seed from her husband would come some 25 years after God gave him the promise of descendants. Genesis 12, 4 and 7 said when God sp first spoke to him, he was 75. And now here it is 25 years later, he still don't have a child. And what happens is we live in such a microwave generation that when we pray, we think God should answer tomorrow. He should answer today, but God don't forget prayers. Sometimes things don't happen until the right time. Delay does not mean denial. Going back to the same John the Baptist, his mama was named Elizabeth and his, uh, his daddy was named, thank you, sir. His daddy was named Zechariah. And Zechariah, and the same thing that happened to Abraham and Sarah happened to Zechariah and Elizabeth. They both were old and they were dumb. They was like, okay. All right, God, uh, we ain't going to have no children. And uh, Zechariah can just still perform as a priest. Here goes Zechariah with his old self. Headed to do the will of God. And he was still standing in the gap as a priest. And you know what happened? All of a sudden, while he's in there worshiping and interceding on behalf of the people, then the Lord spoke to him, Zacharias, you're going to have a son. No, no, no. This is what God told him. He said, Zacharias, I heard your prayer. And you were, wait a minute, hold up, God. You mean the prayer I prayed? prayed 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you're talking about that prayer, I stopped praying that prayer. Can I tell you something? The prayers you stop praying, God still remembers. Oh, I can't get no help in here. When you give up on your dreams, God don't give up. Because if it is a word and a dream from God, it may not happen. The old folks used to say, he may not come when you want him to, but he's right on. In fact, I like to say it this way. He, he, he don't have to come, but why? Because he's Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is already there. And when you talk about the Lord Shema, meaning you don't have to wait for God to show up. Before you even step on the scene, God is already there. In other words, 
It ain't over till it's over. <laughs> pull, pull that, pull that pad out. Pull that notepad out. Pull that piece of paper out you wrote down 10, 20 years ago. You never know. And can I tell you something? And now I speak as a business owner, a man who um, is an entrepreneur and have employees that I have to make sure get paid. I can tell you something in the midst of pandemic moments like 2020, this is a season of entrepreneurship. This is a creative, I don't, I, I, I can't put my finger on it always. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, the prophet like Pastor D is, you know, he can see it a whole lot further. But listen, God is speaking. If you've lost jobs, if you've lost income, sometimes God has to evict you into purpose. Y'all ain't catching this. Sometimes you have to lose in order to gain. It ain't over till it's over. God doesn't fulfill promises in our timing. He fulfills them in his time according to his will. Hmm. God showed Joseph a palace. He showed Joseph that his parents and his brothers would be bowing down to him, but he showed him palace-like results, but not the pain of a pit and the injustice of a prison. God don't show you all the stuff you got to go through in order to get where you're going to. But what you're going through is designed to get you to where you're going to. I want y'all to get that. Don't give up on God. Y'all know the song. Because he what? He's what? Y'all saying that with conviction until something happened and you ain't singing no more. Like Sarah, you might have one egg left, one opportunity left that unlocks your dreams. All it takes is one phone call, one meeting with one person. All it takes is one egg to bring forth new life and the one life can bring forth many lives. Good God Almighty. But only God can call those things that be not as though they were. We can't call it. Well, I, I, I know about that preacher because I read in Job 22 and 28 that we can decree a thing and it shall be established. And I'm so glad you brought that verse up. Because Job 22 and 1 said, it was Eliphaz, his friend, that made that statement. And when you go to Job 42 and 7, God, speaking of Job, said, Eliphaz didn't tell you the right information. Job 42 and said, um, uh, when it came to rebuking uh, Job's friends, God rebuked Eliphaz in Job 42 and 7 for giving Job the wrong information and advice. So watch this, everything in the Bible, watch this, everything in the Bible is truly stated, but everything in the Bible is not a statement of truth. Let me say that again. Everything in the Bible is truly stated, but everything in there is not a statement of truth. Everything in the Bible is descriptive. You can, you can read the stories, but it's not prescriptive for our living. Just because Solomon had 700 wives, don't give us permission to get 700 wives. I just believe I can just go ahead and have some. If Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, he had multiple wives because it's in the Bible. Everything is in the Bible is for our learning, but it's not for your prescription. This is the inerrant, infallible word of God, but God wanted the good, the bad, and the ugly to be included in it. God is, though, I'm about to bring this home. 
a promise keeper. Watch this though. But study the scriptures accurately to know what the, those promises are. Because if you're not getting the results you think you should have got or not getting, that's not what he said. God is good all the time. All the time God is good regardless of what's going on in our lives. Period. I can't call it, but only God can. God is good all the time. But watch this. You have to have such faith in God and believe that God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think and uh, kind of appending something that Pastor D said last week about uh, decreeing and declaring and all those things. We, what we can do is ask God and we can make our requests known to God. But at the end of the day, it's the Lord, the Lord's will this or the Lord wills that. God, your will be done on earth as it's being done in heaven, right? It's God. God, I just submit my life to you. God, I give it to you. I'm going through trouble, but God, I still trust you. I still love you. I never forget when, when the doctor first told us and when the doctor first spoke this into my mom's ears and said, we couldn't get everything and Mrs. Outing more than likely this is what's going to take you home and my mother paused and said Lord first of all the first thing she wanted to do is pray with the doctor she said can I pray for you and my sister said mom you need to listen right now and mom end up saying, Lord, you have been so good to me and there is nothing that will stop me from loving you. And I'm just bawling. I I'm the crier of the family. I'm just crying, just crying, bawling my eyes out. I, I had what they call, um, it it's, it's a special terminology, but it was it's called um, pre, uh, pre something grief where when you're expecting the worst you grieve in advance before it happens and that was me because I was a basket case every time we did a zoom call with the doctor or a conference call uh, with my siblings we I'm the one just, just crying. Dave, it's going to be all right. Yeah, I couldn't even hardly talk. But the moment mama gave up the ghost, after giving us her benediction, when she told us, I want y'all to be ready when Jesus returns. And she said, I want you to love one another. You husbands, you love your wives. Train your children up in the way that they should go. She was preaching to us while she was dying. Not long after that, she gave up the ghost. Soon as mama left here, it was like my tears dried up. I had less tears after the fact. I had more tears before the fact. I can't explain it. But I said to myself, Lord, and then my mind rewinded 20 years earlier when dad was at church because he was a pastor getting ready to teach Bible study and died there on the church grounds. And when I came into the hospital and they told me, your dad, dad is gone. And I remember going into the room where my mama was and brother was and crying. And I said, Lord, I thank you. That's the only thing that could come out of my mouth. Lord, I, why am I thanking him? Because the hero, the patriarch of the family, my, 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 everything has just gone on to be with the Lord. But I said, Lord, I thank you because I even had a daddy. Thank you, Lord, that he was a good father. Thank you that he gave us the scriptures and he preached the gospel. God, I give you thanks because the Bible says in all things, he didn't necessarily say for all. I wasn't thanking him for his death, but I was thanking him in his death. 
in all things. Why? Because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Beloved, I just want to encourage y'all today, amen, that God's word is true, amen. It does not fail when it seems like he may have failed you. He has not failed you. If you feel like God has failed you, it's only because we have misinterpreted or misunderstood what the word was really trying to co communicate. And if we can ever get the right understanding, we won't get tripped up on our misinterpretation of scripture because the word of God is true. The word of God, God speaks, amen, and the universe lapped into existence. God is God and beside him there is no other. God is God and he will save those that are lost, deliver those that are bound, set free those that are captive. God is the God who can cause the dead to come alive. God is the God huh, that can cause those who got sickness huh, to still be sustained. Huh. Because what some of y'all don't know, huh, I live with cancer every single day. Huh. Before I came here this morning, huh, I had to take two chemo pills. Huh, and then I have to take two chemo pills tonight. Huh. But you guess what? Huh? I'm not going to let the cancer define me. Because the God I live huh, is the God huh, who is with me in life. Huh, he's with me in death. Huh, he's with me all the time. Huh, the God that I serve, uh, he can sustain me when nobody else can. The God of my My God, my God. You know what I told God? I said, God, don't let me waste my cancer. What do I mean by that? God, I know you are able, like the three Hebrew boys. God, you're able to deliver us from this fiery furnace. But even if you don't, we still not going to bow. God, if you don't deliver me, and I said to God, you are my healer. But God, if you want me to have this cancer so I can encourage those who have cancer, don't let me waste it. Keep me around. My prayer is that I will live to see my great, great grandchildren like my grandparents did. But if God decide to do anything else, I'm like Paul. He said for me to live is Christ and to die is King. All the days of my appointed time, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait till my change come. It might come here or it might come there, but my change is going to come. Can somebody say yes? Glory to God. Tell you something. That's why you have to follow the Holy Spirit. Because six years ago, I had one doctor. And they were great. I loved them. Because they were the ones that diagnosed it and said I had a chronic form of leukemia. And the doctor said that you will have this for the rest of your life. And you have to take this chemo medicine for the rest of your life. You know what I said to the doctor? I say, I don't have to take this for the rest of my life. I just have to take it today. Y'all ain't got it. The rest of my life is too long. I just want victory today. I'll take it today. If tomorrow comes, tomorrow becomes today. And I'll take it today then. And I've been taking it for six and a half years. But that, that, that's not the story, that's not the story. About two and a half years ago, the Lord led me to change doctors. I felt like I just needed to change and let another doctor who specializes in my situation take a look at my situation. Dr. Sakari is his name. And he looked at my charts. He said, David, 
I see you've been taking one medication, but I tell you what I'm going to do. And boy, he used a sports analogy, Pastor D. You know what he said? He said, you've been on NCAA medicine. I want to put you on NBA level. He changed my prescription. Now, the other one, mind you, I only had to take one a day, one pill, but it felt like chemo. Sometimes I have to sit down and just not do anything. My, mom, my wife would know, okay, he just need a moment because that chemo is working on him. When he changed my prescription, I got to take uh, four instead of one pill, and I have to take it twice a day, but I don't feel nothing. I don't feel a thing. That ain't the end of the story. My recent uh, visit was a couple of weeks ago. After a year and a half straight taking this medicine, my leukemia is showing 0 0.0000%. Hey, that ain't the end of the story. But the doctor said, I need you to keep taking your medicine. Remember the first doctor said it was going to be for what? She said, if your numbers stay like this for a year and a half, a total of three years, we can wean you off the chemo. So watch this, I pray every day like my health depends on God, but I take my medicine every day as though it depends on me. And through the partnership of you doing what is right, trusting God, things will be okay. Well, I just trust God. I just don't believe and I don't trust God. Let me ask you a question. Do you lock your doors at night? Why, if you trust God? Do you cut your alarm on? Why? If you believe, hey, I got angels charged over here, and one of them name is ADT. I believe God's going to take me safe home, but I still got to drive correctly. I believe God will heal me, but I still got to take this medicine. It's not an either or, it's a both and. I trust God. I hope y'all got something out of the message today. If you want to be saved or want to dedicate or rededicate your life to the Lord, God loves you. He's for you. If, if, if you've ever been in a crisis of faith and was like, I'm done with you, God, because it seems like you were done with me. You didn't answer my prayer. Come on, get back into the game. If you want to, let me just say this. If you're struggling in your faith because what you prayed or the results you were getting was different than what you were trusting God for. Or if you say, you know what? I've been coming to worship. I've been watching online. And I just, I want to know this Jesus that I see being preached and talked about week after week. If you're that person, just lift your hands up real quick. Just lift your hands. Be honest. If you've been struggling, if you've been struggling like, oh, I don't pray no more because my prayers don't work. Don't stop praying. If you're watching and struggling, if you're watching, you want to be saved, I want you just text 
the name Jesus. Just text Jesus to 407-449-8884. Somebody's going to reach out to you. Myself, one of the ministers, one of the leaders. And my, my desire would be we would reach out to you today. Because I don't want you to struggle. I've been there. I felt like God failed me at one time. Pastor D, you know my story. I walked away from Pastor. I was like, God, you can, you can have this. I ain't preaching no more. Why preach and I'm getting the results that I'm getting? I was feeling like a failure and God said to me, if you are a failure, then so am I. Because I got children like the children of Israel. I did everything for them and they still served idol gods. So if the choices of those you love determine how good of a parent you are, then I'm just as big of a failure as you are. And God was saying, you ain't a failure. You've done what you're supposed to do. And now I see fruit from years of praying. I'm seeing God turn things around even in areas that I've been praying for years about. Things in my family, things in our business, things in our health. There was a season where I just felt like I was a loser. But I would be excited about everybody else's wins. Praise the Lord, man, they winning. And I walk away and like, God, when I'm gonna win? But in due season, you will reap if you don't give up. Father, in the name of Jesus, heal the sick, the sick of mind, the sick of body. Deliver those who are bound. Strengthen those who are in a crisis of faith. Save those that are lost. Build your church. Because you are the builder of it, Lord, and the gates of hell won't prevail against us. God, I just pray that you breathe upon this church, breathe upon the body of Christ in this region, in this city, in our nation, in our world. God, I pray for revival within your church, God, I pray for, God, an outpour of your spirit upon, upon us, God, here in this nation and here in our city. And let this place be a beacon of light for those who are walking in darkness. Now, Father, have your way in and through us. And may we submit to your word because it is only you that can take that which be not and make it as though it were. In Jesus' name, for your glory and for your honor, clap your hands for Jesus. Hallelujah.